I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. And tonight, we are going to speak with two guests about the life and work of Jerome Lejeune, a research doctor and a geneticist who discovered the cause for several chromosomal abnormalities, among which was Down syndrome. And on January 21st of last year, he was named Venerable by Pope Francis. We'll be joined in a few minutes by Mark Bradford, who is the former president of the Jerome Lejeune Foundation in the United States. But first, we want to talk with the postulator for the cause of Venerable Jerome's canonization. She is also the author of a new book entitled Jerome Lejeune, A Man of Science and Conscience. You can get this book at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 4118, 4118. Now, joining us via Skype from Paris, France, not Paris, Texas, please welcome Aude Juga. Aude, welcome very, to our show. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you. Oh, it's a delight. First of all, I want folks to understand what does a postulator for the cause of a saint do? What, what is it that is your assignment or task? Um, it's um, quite a huge work we have to do because we have to show, to give to the Vatican, the proof that uh, the servant of God, Jerome Jean for me, um, as was a saint. So we have to prove that uh, he, he has each Christian virtue and uh, at a live, heroical level. So we have to give the proof of faith and charity and hope and uh, temperance, prudence and justice and, uh, and strength. So, yes. and for all his life. So we have to study everything, to read all the documents, all his letters uh, with uh, his family, his wife. In the case of Jerome, it was wonderful because uh, we had 2,000 letters from him to his wife and from his wife to him. So they wrote uh, to each, uh, each one together. Uh, every time they were not together in Paris, uh, they, they wrote each day. So we have so many information thanks to these letters. Mm -hmm. And of all his conference, his publication, and he, he made 500 publications. So we have to read everything, of course. And there is two, um, a tribunal with, uh, was to, to listen to so many witnesses for, who can testify to, on the life of Jerome Jeune, from mm -hmm. the childhood to the, his death. And uh, has, how, Jerome Jeune was a public man, of course, very famous, so there are so many things to say, and we had to learn and to read and to listen to everything. So this is the first part of the process. It is a diocesan process uh, from two th 2007 to 2012 in Paris. And we gather all these proofs. And after, the second step is in the Vatican in, in Rome. And the postulator uh, must go to Rome to work in the Vat with the Vatican, with the Congregation for the Cause of the Saints. So I, I moved to, to Rome. It was a huge sacrifice, as you can imagine. Yeah, yeah. It was beautiful. Yes. And I spent four years in Rome to, to study all these uh, documents and to write what we call the Positio, the, the, the book for more than 1,000 pages. And in this book, I made the, the analyse, analysis of his life, and I tried to give the proof and to explain to the, to the Church, to the Vatican, how Jerome Jean uh, was a saint. And as you say, we were very, very pleased last year, on January, when the Pope, Pope Francis, agreed to the promulgation of the decree, of the, the, the decree recognizing 
the every city of the virtue is of Jerome Jeune, because this is a very important step, the first step to the beatification. And now we can say that he, he is venerable. And of course, for the postulate uh, is a very important step because it, it means that all the, the work we, we did was good enough to give the proof that he was a saint. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, you know, this is, uh, I think, a very important canonization among others because sometimes secular society tries to portray the church as being against science. And this is not the case. And we see that oftentimes the Galileo case is used as the main reason for that. And the church accepted the evidence uh, when, they, when they had the proof. Um, so it's not that we're anti-science. Here, we're also recognizing sanctity and morality within science. That uh, after the 20th century, when there were many scientists engaged in immoral research, um, even at the Nazi concentration camps, bad quality science that was immoral was done. And in contrast to Dr. Mengele and others who did evil research, here we have a moral, virtuous, and pious scientist as a contrast. Would that be a fair way to place this? Yes, this is very interesting because you focus on the, on the main reason for me or the sanctity of Jérôme Jeune. Um, you know, I, I used to say that uh, Jérôme Jeune was a, um, a wise man. He is a false wise man, a my, the wise man of the magi of the modern times. Mm -hmm. And uh, this week we can say that. I, th I think that 2,000 years after the, the Epiphany, uh, Jérôme Lejeune showed the, that the, the body of human life and uh, he used his knowledge only for that. And like the wise man, he, he went to the child and he, he kneeled before the, the child, and even the sick child, the child uh, with disability, and uh, of course, the unborn child. And uh, he used his wisdom only to, in service of human life and uh, of, the, of the little children, and um, even, of course, the most fragile. And I think that uh, he showed us Doing that, he showed the star, and he shows how we have to to follow the star, the star of the truth, the star of the life, and the star of God. And um, I think that is really for that is an example today. Is uh, for me is one of the most beautiful, most important, one of the best example in the modern world for scientists and scientific and uh, physician, but also for men of law, because he always chose the truth. And you know that uh, it was not always very easy for him, as it, and it's not easy for us today, but it was not easy for him. And he's, he knew that uh, he could get a lot of troubles telling the truth and um, and trying to to defend the the children with Down syndrome and the preborn child, but he chose to defend them. He chose to to serve them instead of his uh, power, his career, and the uh, honors. And uh, doing that, he got a lot of troubles. But he never deviated of this uh, of this way, and um, and for that is a fantastic example of uh, strength and of a man of conscience and of man of science and um, and maybe one of the best scientists uh, of the of our century of course and uh, for me one of the best saints even if 
I have to be very prudent because church has not uh, said as he sent now we have to wait for a miracle it's just venerable but now but for me it's a saint I'm sure he is and um, and I was amazed by this uh, mix between um, intelligence and love so he was a, a genius we can really say that he was a genius with so much humility like the the king uh, the wise man, he, he went with his Jenny, with his intelligence, in front of this baby. And this intelligence is a, the, very important in, in his uh, sanctity, because he used his intelligence for, the, for the, the good, and only for the good of the humanity. And he not, did not use his intelligence against the faith, and this is very important. And we often say that Jerome Jean got so many enemies because he was a servant of life. That's true. But I think that there is another reason too. I think that it's also because he, he did not use his intelligence, his science, his knowledge against faith and against church, but in the, in the opposite, on the contrary. He used his intelligence to show that between faith and science, there is nothing, no contradiction. Yep. He always show that faith and science go together to find the, the truth, to understand the world, to understand the, the creation. And he used to say that it can be opposition, it can be a contradiction between faith and science, because science um, help us to, to understand the world, to understand how the world um, works. Mm -hmm. But faith give us the information that our knowledge can get by his, uh, our intelligence, because our intelligence is very small in, 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 in the world. We can't say, we can know everything. So he said the faith um, is, a, is an help to understand the world, to understand the, the creation. So they go, they go all together. And uh, as a genetist, he was very interested, of course, by uh, the creation of the man, of Adam and Eve, and he, he worked a lot, um, he, he read a lot of Bible and uh, Genesis, and he was very interesting by the, um, the creation of Adam and Eve, and he, and he tried to explain, as a geneticist, how it could uh, uh, happen, how how the first man and the first woman can arrive on, uh, on the hearse. Um, so it was very interesting, and maybe it was one of one of the first to say that the the, um, the explanation of Darwin can't explain anything, does not expl explain anything. Yeah. Um, it does not say. It did not say. This is very important that everything was was wrong in Darwin's theory. But he said that the, the theory of Darwin telling that uh, we we are like a, a, a monkey it, it, it's, uh, it's not true. Um, but I can't explain here because it's so it's too difficult. But it's very interesting, and I and I explain that in the book because I think that it's very important especially for uh, students in medicine, because um, it's very important for everybody and for Christians to understand the apparition the, of the first man and the first woman in the, in the world, and to understand how uh, Genesis, Genesis and Bible are not against science, on the opposite, everything is growing together. Yeah, and it's something that I've often taught my students. My field is uh, scripture. And I've often taught my students that in the ancient world, they began to learn science, but they couldn't continue it because they believed that the forces of nature were gods who could attack them. Whereas in the Bible, it's everything is good. Everything is laid out in wisdom. Humans have reason to discover that wisdom, and everything is just a creature. Odd, thank you so much for explaining this part. We will continue on our discussion back here in the United States, but I also want to remind everyone that uh, everybody can still get your book 
uh, which is called Jerome Lejeune, a man of science and conscience, by this guest, Aud Juga, and it is available at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 4118. Um, and uh, be sure that you tune in to EWTN on Friday, January 21st at 8 p.m. because we will show a wonderful documentary called Venerable Jerome Lejeune to the least of these, my brothers and sisters. And by the way, if you have kids going to college, Odd's book is a good one so that they can be prepared to deal with false claims by amateur scientists, <laughs> sometimes professionals too. But we'll be back in a couple of minutes with our next, next guest, Mr. Mark Bradford, and we'll hear more about the work of Venerable Jerome Lejeune and how it continues today, so please stay with us. Welcome back. Our guest now is a former president of the Jerome Lejeune Foundation here in the United States. And he's here tonight to tell us more about the amazing work and faithful ethics of geneticist Dr. Jerome Lejeune. And joining us via Skype from Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, please welcome Mr. Mark Bradford. Mark, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry it turned out that I couldn't be there with you this evening. Well, we're delighted to have you at least here through Skype. It's been that way this year many times, so uh, good right. to have you with us. And, you know, we were talking with Aud, who's just wonderful. Um, we were talking to her about the process of moving towards beatification of Jerome Lejeune. But you also have a strong sense of the way, some ways, a variety of ways, he is relevant to us in the modern society. Um, talk a little bit about that. Sure. You know, there are many ways. Uh, very simply, I think, just in the way he dealt with people. You know, he, he fought a lot of battles in his life. And his children would also often ask him, uh, you know, Papa, why, how, how, how can you take this from these people? Why don't you get angry? Why don't you fight back? And he says, well, I'm, I'm not fighting against people. I'm fighting against ideas. And he always kept that foremost in his mind is as many contentious situations as he found himself in. He never, never directed his frustration at the individual or an anger or a hatred toward the individual. He was always focused on fighting against the ideas that they upheld. He was living at a pretty difficult time in Paris uh, through the 1960s, the student revolts that happened there. Uh, also, he was a contemporary of someone whose name we hear often these days, Michel Foucault, in the midst of all of the critical theory stuff that's going on these days, and cultural Marxism, as it's sometimes called. He was a contemporary of his, and in the abortion debates, if you read into them, you can see Michel Foucault fighting on the, on the side of the abortionists, trying to get a, abortion embedded in French society. You know, Foucault <clears throat> used uh, his ideas of the relationship between power and knowledge to change social uh, structures. Mm -hmm. And he was behind the effort to implement the laws that liberalized abortion and provided for abortion in France. And, mm -hmm. Of course, these are the situations that Lejeune found himself arguing deeply in, and these are the situations that uh, we would use the word these days ended up getting him canceled, which is largely what happened. And there were a few times throughout his career where he spoke very boldly against what was happening in his field of genetics, where his discovery 
and I, I, I'm assuming that everyone knows what his discovery was. He, under, he made the discovery that there was a 20, an extra copy of the 21st chromosome, which caused Down syndrome, among many other discoveries. But, but in doing that, he realized that he had opened a pathway to abortion. He realized that through a prenatal test, a woman would know if she was carrying a child that had an extra 21st chromosome, therefore a trisomy child, trisomy 20 Down syndrome, commonly call it in the United States, and would be given the opportunity to abort. So that's why he fought very hard on two fronts. He fought very hard against the movement to abort these children, and he worked very hard in his professional life to researching what he hoped would be a cure to be able to save these children from the fate that he knew they would be destined to receive, and that fate would be their abortion. So. Uh, in 1969, he received the highest award a geneticist can receive in San Francisco, California, actually, called the William Allen Memorial Award. And he decided that night, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> he decided that night that he would make himself clear and speak plainly to the audience uh, and, and tell them that the use of their discipline of genetics for the destruction of human life was intolerable. And he even used words, something to the effect that the National Institute of Health should be renamed to be called the National Institute of Death because it was promoting the destruction of children through abortion who were deemed to not be acceptable in society because of their genetic constitution. Uh, I have a clip <laughs> that I'd like to show of Lejeune actually speaking back in 1970. I think it might be the reference no, you're making. So let's take a look at that clip. Perfect. Bonsoir. Good evening. Our opening topic of this evening is the children who aren't like others. In 1970, the abortion debate reaches France. A draft bill brought in by Dr. Perret offers to allow so-called prophylactic abortion for embryos identified as having disabilities. I have heard of prophylactic abortion, and I would like to ask what you call prophylactic. Prophylaxis is preventing an infection. For instance, from a medical point of view, vaccines are delivered in a prophylactic way. And in the present case, a pregnancy is terminated to avoid the birth of a malformed child. This man asked a specific question and he was perfectly right. Prophylactic does not mean killing the patients and it never will. Yet if you tell a geneticist, examine this child's chromosomes and if they are abnormal, I will eliminate him. You are asking us very clearly to play Pontius Pilate's role and to wash our hands of what people will do afterwards. Well, no, we are doctors. I do not speak from a scholar's chair. I am talking about children, children who are made of flesh and bones, and I do not want to kill these children because they are patients. We can honestly ask ourselves if there is anything worse for a man who is a scientist, a discoverer, than realizing his discovery will completely clash with his beliefs. The inner debate must be something absolutely terrifying. There are probably little ones with Down syndrome who are 10, 15 years old, and who are listening to us and who understand us despite what you think, and who couldn't possibly believe that you could suggest to eliminate children who resemble them. As a doctor, I will not let you tell them that. He was pretty clear and pretty strong in that. Um, it's very impressive. Um, I think he came across, the, the way that the video portrayed this, uh, the, the one man questioning, is that, you know, it must be difficult that uh, you can use a, a scientist discovery <laughs> to contradict his beliefs. But this is the nature of human life. People use good things for very bad purposes every day. Right. There's, there's nothing wrong with uh, alcohol, nothing wrong with sexuality. There's nothing wrong with uh, a firearm, 
All, all these things are just uh, uh, morally, they're just good objects. But right. when you rape somebody, the good sexuality has gone wrong. When you murder somebody with a firearm, a fine firearm has been used for a wrong purpose, uh, an evil purpose. And this right. can happen in science too. That's what Lejeune was uh, dealing with. That's exactly right. And, you know, if we bring that to the current day, there's so much controversy around prenatal testing. I think it was in 2011, maybe, where something called non-invasive prenatal screening or non-invasive prenatal testing was first released on the market. <clears throat> it's a means where, with just a simple blood draw, they can identify uh, cell-free DNA circulating in the mother's blood from the child and make a determination whether or not the child has a genetic disability. Early on, I think it was primarily Down syndrome, but a couple of others now I don't recall. So that <clears throat> that instigated a whole controversy around prenatal, non-invasive prenatal testing. Many people saying it's evil. Well, I knew a researcher who was working on um, a, a prenatal therapy for children that could be identified as having Down syndrome and thinking that they could make good progress before the child was even born in improving the lot of the child. <coughs> Excuse me, improving the lot of the child once they were born by fighting back the inflammation that naturally occurs in the child uh, <clears throat> because of the extra chromosome. So, you know, non-invasive prenatal testing, is it being used for an evil purpose? If it's being used for a purpose to abort a child, yes. The use, just as you stated, Father, the purpose of that tool, that neutral tool, is, is, an, is, is being used toward an evil end. But if we should be able to find a therapy, one, Jerome Lejeune's whole life was committed to finding a cure to save these children. And since we can have, even if it's a non-invasive prenatal test, a blood test, we still have amniocentesis. We still have you know, other ways that we can manage to identify those things. Perhaps at some point, non-invasive prenatal screening can be used to the benefit to save these children if we can find ways to develop prenatal therapies that will improve their life lives and reduce the fear a parent has when they're about to give birth to a child with Down syndrome because yeah. they know that they will have such a better life than they might have otherwise. Yeah. I'd like to uh, also play yet another clip by Lejeune, it's him speaking, about this issue. Is the medical community fighting for the patient? or fighting for the disease. Right. This is something like this. So let's take a look at this clip too, because it's right. relevant Good. today. Perfect. My personal impression, which is just the Hippocratic line, is we are at the service of patients. We are not at the service of disease. So the people who propose to kill a, a Down syndrome baby in utero because they have detected that he was or she was Down syndrome are just making the enormous mistake of fighting for the disease against a patient. And medicine is a contrary. Medicine is a very simple application of knowledge. It is the hate of the disease and the love for the patient. You cannot change the two terms. And this is something that can be turned in a variety of ways. Uh, sometimes doctors can be more interested in supporting, say, the um, industries that make medicines. Uh, they can be more interested in supporting uh, government. They can be more interested in fighting the diseases or in fighting against the patients or for the patients. These, these are moral choices that doctors have to consider when they are working uh, in any situation, whether it's life and death or not. And Lejeune gave real guidance, moral guidance, in how to approach these issues. 
Yeah, he did. And uh, you were asking about how he's relevant today. I think that's one area in which he's extremely relevant. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the devil's not creative. The devil has a great marketing team, but he's not very creative, fundamentally. He never comes up with anything new. He's just repackaging the old stuff. <laughs> Believe me, I hear can... confessions. I'm well aware <laughs> that the sins are pretty much the same old, same old. So, uh, you know, in the abortion debates that happened in France and the United States really about the same time in the early 1970s, it's, it's about the destruction of human life. <clears throat> it's about, at, at, a, at, a more deeper, at a more deep level, perhaps it's even about the denial of a nature, right? It's about the denial of the nature of motherhood. It's about the denial of the true origin of life and its purpose. Uh, and, and Lejeune saw those things clearly in the, in the battles that he fought on behalf of life and lost his career largely because of it. He lost his funding. He had no, he had no uh, subsidies for his lab. He had to go begging across the world for people who would support him so he could continue his research. From the time that he made his discovery until the time he appeared in, to, in San Francisco to receive the William Allen Memorial Award, that's maybe nine years, he had had 50 invitations to scientific conferences in the United States. After he came out so clearly <clears throat> at, in San Francisco condemning the National Institute of Health as the National Institute of Death, calling out geneticists for the way that they were using his field, in the following five years, he was invited to five. Yeah. scientific conferences after. Yeah. So his reputation in the United States, at least, was largely largely ruined because of it, except with people like uh, the Shrivers, Eunice Kennedy Shriver and her husband, mm -hmm. Sergeant Shriver, who saw the world as he did and supported him. And, you know, he did receive the Kennedy Prize in 1962, which is a great blessing for him. But, but today and, and we have... So to folks understand, Eunice uh, and Sergeant Shriver uh, Eunice was one of the Kennedy sisters, and Sergeant Shriver married her, and they were, I believe, the founders of Special Olympics they and were. did tremendous amount of work for decades to lift up the dignity of people with Down syndrome. This is, uh, a, you know, it's got its challenges, and it's got its range of difficulties, but there is an inherent dignity that's a human dignity. They're not subhuman in any way at all. They're yeah. fully human and uh, quite, quite wonderful people. And that was everyone that met Jerome Lejeune, and I'm so sorry I never had the opportunity to. I knew his wife very well, and I know his family, and they're all incredible people, beautiful, beautiful family, wonderful people, very supportive still of the work that he did and continuing it on his behalf. But that is something that he was very known for. He would, he would bring a young patient into his clinical practice, and you have to realize, before he made his discovery, people had all sorts of superstitions about the cause of Down syndrome. They thought it was some impure living you know, the parents, something that the parents punishment. have done that caused this. Yeah, punishment, whatever. And he, he brought the child in, and the parents were nervous and hesitant, and he took the child onto his lap, and he played with the child and took off its shoes and played with its toes and, and talked about how beautiful the child was and what a wonderful child, and asked the child's name and called the child by name, humanized the person. He saw the deep humanity in the person. I think Ode mentioned something about this in the clip that you played with mm -hmm. her earlier. Yeah, who, he, he, he saw the deep humanity behind every individual, even those individuals that he disagreed with and got into arguments with. That's why he said he was always fighting against their ideals and not against the person, because he saw those people as a child of God, worthy of respect. All people. As, mm -hmm. as a child of God, worthy of respect, especially as he called them the least of his brothers and sisters, taking that quote obviously from Scripture. Yeah. Right. So it was, you know, he was tr a truly remarkable man in every way that we can we can recognize. Ode's book, I would encourage everyone to, to read it. It, it's the most. She's done a fabulous job. I think this may be the first book she ever wrote. 
but she's done a beautiful job of bringing the humanity of the person, Jerome Lejeune, very prominently to the fore and uh, bringing out a lot of information in the book that even his wife, Beer, didn't really realize or had been so many years that she had forgotten it or letters that she hadn't read or, uh, read or whatever. So, yeah, remarkable man, remarkable man, remarkable friend of life. Um, you know, interestingly, <clears throat> well, I'm sorry. Well, I, you know, I also uh, like that in her book, she also includes the very important work of science. I mean, he wasn't, you know, like some of the movies we may have seen of 19th century scientists who were just working on their own and doing their, uh, you know, their research by themselves. He was very much part of a team. He used, you know, very careful scientific me uh, methods, uh, which were getting ever more refined and still are and was very serious about his research. Right. And at the same time, never forgot God, who's the author of the knowledge that scientists are discovering, and the morality <coughs> that God requires of us as we use knowledge, that no matter what the knowledge may be, we all very much need to use that um, and, and keep developing science. You know, the development of science is a wonderful thing so long as it's directed towards ethics. Right. I have one more clip I'd like us to take a look at along that line because Good. he really had uh, very sincere and strongly felt uh, hopes of being able to cure Down syndrome. So let's take a look at that clip. Great. People are afraid of genetic manipulation. They say it's no good to know how the genes are working. It's very dumb. It's very important we know that because if we can understand how a bad gene is doing a bad job, we can either repair the bad job or repair the bad gene itself. We will do that some. But the danger is that people will use human being, will exploit human being uh, for their own particular interests or their own particular research. That is totally against the Hippocratic medicine. That is totally against medicine as we know it. But it's a new age biology applied to men. Yeah, this is where, he, again, he has hope, and, and I would say a, a human hope, an optimism about discovering more, but also a Christian hope for the betterment of people who would suffer without medical development. But at the same time that he has hope, it's not blind hope. He's aware of reality of evil and what he can do. Right. Yeah. He, uh, he fully integrated his faith in with his scientific pursuits. And as you say, he was very aware of the dangers inherent in them. And he was, you know, Ud mentioned uh, his meditations on the Magi. And he said that what, what was required of the wise men were both a desire and humility. They had the desire to find what the star was leading them to. And they had the humility to ask the questions to get there of, mm -hmm. the, those of the law of the theologians. And then when they arrived, they, they had the simplicity, the humility to kneel down and acknowledge who they had found. And the problem with science, in his mind, it was that it was lacking in humility. Science presumed to have the answers. You know, if, if we look back through history, we can look back into the Middle Ages, maybe, and we can see that everything was seen as emanating from God. Everything was a mm -hmm. divine origin. But then as we move through time, we get into the Renaissance, and then we move into the Enlightenment, we start pushing up against that, right? We start trusting more and more in human capacity to solve problems, answer these questions. 
and it, and and we lose the tension between the imminent and the transcendent, and the transcendent disappears, and the imminent takes over everything. We we can solve all the answers to all the questions. Jerome Lejeune never believed that science could solve all the questions. Yeah, he, yeah. He he realized its limitations, and that's where charity comes into play. You love, you love where there is suffering that you can't, you can't heal. You simply love. Yeah. And that's what he did for his patients. He loved his patients. While he worked, committed his entire life to trying to identify a cure for them, he loved them all along the way. He loved everyone he came into contact with, from what I understand. He was an amazing man. Well, and, and this is a, a very real <clears throat> issue for anybody who is taking care of <clears throat> any human with some sort of disorder. For instance, people whose friends and relatives have cancer and other, you know, death-dealing uh, diseases, that you, you can't fix it at some point. And so you stay with them, loving them, and, you know, as they go on to the next life. And that's what you do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you mind, we have a caller who's called in, and I'd like to go to her. Uh, Sandy, are you there? Yes, Father Mitch, how are you? Hi, fine, where are you calling from? I'm just outside of Branson, Missouri. Okay, great, and what is your question? Well, I just was wondering why, um, I was older, I was older when I had my one and only daughter, and they were pushing the amnio test, but I think I read on the pamphlet that there could be harm done or serious damage done to that child. And so even if she'd come out with three heads on, I would have loved her. I just hate that no more is being said to discourage that amnio test because of the problems that can happen from mm -hmm. it. Okay, okay. Um, Mark, do you have any comments on that? Well, uh, there is this uh, a level of risk with amniocentesis, and I don't. I'm not a medical doctor. I can't speak to the medical issues there. Mm -hmm. But that yeah. was one of the arguments in favor of non-invasive prenatal testing that I mentioned earlier, because mm -hmm. it doesn't require any intrusion into the womb. Mm -hmm. It's just a blood draw. But actually, there was an article in the New York Times recently showing how inaccurate that test has become for some genetic anomalies. Yes. You yes. have to be very, very careful with that. But yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, in some places, uh, in India, for instance, they sometimes try to use the test to detect the gender because, unfortunately, uh, girls are seen as a liability among many people. Uh, and they, they claim to be able to identify the gender, and then it's even that, which is not a disorder, it's, it's a no, normality <laughs> yeah. uh, to, to be a girl um, in, or a boy, uh, that they often find that they make a mistake after they abort the child and realize, oh, it was a boy, and then they have to be careful that they don't say anything to the patient because uh, it could be sued. So this is, um, this is a very important thing. We it have is. another question. Uh, Anthony? Yes, Father Miss. Happy New Year. Well, my wife and I love you. Oh, thanks. Uh, where, where are you from? Um, Orlando, Florida. Wonderful. Right now. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, we were wondering about this, this question about the Catholic Church and when does the Catholic, uh, excuse me, the Catholic Church decide when the, the science is going too far as it is today, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when when does the church uh, step in and say, wait a minute, uh, this is too far, and, uh, you know, we, we'd like you to ask it. <laughs> Great. That's a superb question, and this is precisely where Le, Le Jeune, I think, has helped us. Mark, do you have any comments on that? Well... Maybe I'll leave that one to you. You're probably better qualified to answer that question than I am. <laughs> All right. Here, Anthony, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to, to get at it. One of the things that the church uh, keeps an eye on is the development of research in which people 
uh, can be taking life or preventing, unnecessarily preventing uh, the new uh, life. Uh, for instance, there are times when a woman has cancer that requires a hysterectomy so that she doesn't die. That's one thing. But when people do surgeries that alter the ability to be open to life uh, in their rela relationships, then you have a moral question. You also see um, th that the church has a very great interest in what is going to go on in the future effects of research. For instance, if you do change something genetic, it's not just for that one individual. It is possibly a change that will go down into the future, and that means that where we are in the present and what our predilections, our desires might be, can control the, ge the genetic future for many generations. And the church is very concerned about that. And it's also obviously concerned <laughs> about the misuse of medicine for the sake of, say, profit, that, uh, that some people are willing to do any kind of research if it causes, if it brings them financial profit and neglects a lot of other issues um, that are actually about life and death or about improving life. So this is why, Anthony, we have uh, a number of clergy who, and laity for that matter, uh, who are involved in medical ethics. There's a Catholic Medical Association and other professional groups, uh, a ca the Catholic uh, Pharmaceutical Association, uh, and a variety of these that bring the Catholic moral perspective and spirituality to bear on issues. So, uh, a uh, someone that we've had a number of times on EWTN, Dr. Robin Pierucci, uh, and uh, some of her colleagues are appearing before state legislatures and the United States Congress in order to address issues about fetal pain, that small children inside the womb feel pain when they're operated on. That's Dr. Piucci's uh, area, and uh, other doctors. Um, and because of that, there's a kind of care for them. Well, do we care for them? Or, as was done in the 90s, are experiments done on to do surgery on a baby in the uterus without anesthetic? Can you imagine? If somebody did heart surgery on you and you had no anesthetic and this was going on, we're concerned about the ethics of this and a wide variety. So, um, you know, we have uh, lots of uh, Catholic ethicists who are working on this and they report to the church. That's that's very much important. Um, we also have another caller. Hello, uh, Mary? Yes. Hi, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Endicott, New York, Father. Welcome, welcome. What can we do for you this evening? Well, my question is, um, it's surrounded by a statement. Yeah. A while back, practically, my child will be 40 this month, but... While I was pregnant with her, she was my ninth pregnancy, mm -hmm. and I had a very pro-life doctor. Yes. And he asked me to, uh, for agreement to have an amniocentesis test. Mm -hmm. And I was questioned, you know, I was rather stunned, and I questioned him and asked, 
know, you knowing that I'm pro-life, why would you offer that test mm -hmm. for a result of a, you know, a Down syndrome child? You know I would never uh, choose abortion. And he said that it was a requirement through his malpractice insurance. And I wonder, is, uh, is there that much <laughs> pressure given to doctors today in regard to the issue? Uh -huh. Mark, do you have any comments on that? Well, I know that there are lawsuits that have come about because of a, uh, either a misread or a faulty prenatal diagnosis, and a child was born with a disability that the parent didn't expect. So anytime there's something like that that happens that raises the attention of the insurance act actuaries, is that what they're called? And mm -hmm and put some pressure on doctors then to be a little more careful or to insist on a prenatal diagnosis possibly. Uh, again, I'm speaking from outside that industry, but I do remember reading in the past of some lawsuits that were a result of an inappropriate or in incorrect prenatal diagnosis. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, but no one, you know, no one can force yet. It's, I don't know if it's, I'm maybe speaking out of turn, but I don't think any... We're finding so many things required these days that we never would have imagined would have been required in the past. Yes. I, right. I don't know. It's possible that there are requirements now for prenatal screenings, but in the past, they've been optional. I, we had a, with our, oh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, uh, sixth child, my wife had some markers on an ultrasound of a possible genetic anomaly, and we just blew it off and said, who cares? We're not. And we had a very pro-life doctor who said, nah, you're no, you don't want to do that. You'll just take whatever comes. And it turns out he had Down syndrome, which has been a great blessing to our family. So, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah it's, this is one of the things, too. I, uh, I've heard again and again from families I know that there's a, an initial shock because it's, it's never the picture that a parent would have in their mind, oh, I can, you know, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to ha having one, at least one of my kids has Down syndrome. That's, that's usually not the first picture, and it oftentimes is uh, something that stuns parents and siblings. And then they find out what a wonderful gift this child is. Yep. And, you know, uh, how they raise up the quality of family life, and they, they find that giftness. Even when there are some difficulties, they still see that they uh, raise up uh, this. My, my own dad uh, had been a school bus driver in his last years, and at one point, uh, he was given one of the smaller buses uh, that carried the uh, children with mental disabilities, and and many, some of them, not a few, were, were also Downs kids. And it, he was so surprised at how wonderful it was in contrast to the maniacs in the other <laughs> bus. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Yeah. 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 yeah he just, my, he just loved them. He, could, he, could, he was just really surprised at how lovely they were. And so, uh, and, and that, that's not an uncommon experience among parents. They become surprised at what a great gift this is. And yeah. someone like Jerome Lejeune uh, is, is a great emphasis. And just, just back to Mary's question uh, and your statement, it's not something that the law requires, in most, at least not yet. Uh, as you say, there, there are so many lawyers getting involved in medical decisions, but I think that it is the insurance companies pressuring doctors so they don't get sued because they're afraid of the lawyers coming at them. So that's where that is. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I'm, I'm so sorry that we're about out of time. I just want to mention that the Jerome Lejeune Foundation USA can be reached if you go to lejeunefoundation.org. And again, the book is called Jerome Lejeune, A Man of Science and Conscience by Aude Dugas. It's available at ewtnrc.com, where it's item number 4118. And there's a doctor, uh, documentary on venerable Jerome Lejeune to least my brothers and sisters, 
Friday, January 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you, Mark, for being with us. May the Lord Thank bless you, you and all of our audience, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you all and thank you.